Time for our second speaker tonight, um, from UCC's History Department. I'm Noah Donald, is here to talk about exorcisms during the Catholic Reformation.
God. So a demon can't go above him. So basically, if a demon enters a person, it is God's will. If a demon leaves a person, it is God's will. So for an exorcist to perform a successful exorcism, he is working through the will of God. And obviously, if a Catholic exorcist is then performing a successful Catholic exorcism, therefore, he is working for the true religion. And he is working through the will of God. It's also on a much more individual um, passion as well, because um, because exorcism is a sacramental and not a sacrament, so it's not like giving a baptism or it's not like the Holy Eucharist and communion. And um, it relies on the exorcist's personal piety to work. Like it doesn't matter how terrible the priest is, once he raises that bread of communion, that turns to the volume of Christ. It doesn't matter about him, but it does rely on the exorcist's personal piety when they give an exorcism. So therefore, if a person is able to give a successful exorcism, um, that means that they have spiritual, spiritual authority, it means they have personal piety, and I found that to be very crucial in one or two of my cases. So I I hope that was an okay general intro for you. I'll just talk about one or two cases that interest me and that I have found. They all interest me, but some of them are really interesting. Um, so I think the most. The toughest and most interesting case I've come across is the case of Stephen Brown. Um, Stephen Brown was a discalced Carmelite, and um, he was one of the founding members of that order in Ireland. And in Dublin in 1630, he performed a number of public exorcisms on a young girl of around 12 years old. She was possessed by, I believe, seven or eight malignant spirits. Um, this was at a time that, um, that the religious orders in Ireland faced a growing period, and in, not in Ireland, but in Dublin specifically, the months preceding that there was a growth in persecution against religious orders. And it got very tense at the moment. So when Brown performed these public exorcisms, he knew that there could be consequences. And there were. As a result, he was arrested. He was in prison for a number of years. He was also publicly branded an imposter and a sorcerer. And, and I'm actually delighted that happened because <laughs> and as a result of this, when Stephen Brown discusses his exorcism, in his history of the Carmelite Order, which is called Carmelite Order, he goes into massive detail about the symptoms of the young girl obsessed. And this is pretty much the only case that they go into detail about the symptoms of the girl obsessed. Because they're only talking about this themselves, they don't have to justify it. Um, their reasoning for, for asserting that the girl suffered possession, but because he was Branded, publicly branded imposter, when he was writing his history, he decided that he needed to do this. So, I'll go ahead and tell you what the symptoms were. Um, they were pretty typical for um, a demoniac, a person who was possessed. They were also quite dramatic. Um, so, she was said, from numerous sources, she was said to have um, to be levitated. Um, she was able to vomit pins and coins and needles in public. She was able to um, cut through um, wood and iron with her teeth. Um, she was able to know and understand the Latin language, and she couldn't even read or write. Um, and she had strength beyond her natural ability. So at one stage she was depicted uh, as um, being able to fight off six grown soldiers, and she basically knocked them all out. And those last two symptoms, um, in, um, along with another symptom of clairvoyance, knowing things that you shouldn't like, can far away or from the future or they shouldn't be able to know, became identified in the Roman ritual of 1614 as being the three key signs of possession. Because at this time, um, the Catholic Church was promoting itself, it was also reforming itself. And so all of its um, rituals became scrutinised and, and exorcism as well as one of them. So even though um, levitation and vomiting pins and needles was a um, typical symptom of possession, it wasn't enough by then 
to accept that this person is demonically possessed, there had to have been another reason for that. Um, so those were the symptoms that the girl possessed, and um, from then, added, I suppose, to the whole drama. Because imagine you being in public and you see this happening, and then she's cured afterwards. And he kind of added to it, um, supposedly, from another discussed Carmelite who was writing about it called Arthur Merlin. He says that um, Brown invoked the power of the Eucharist in his exorcism. So um, one of the exorcisms occurred after Mass. Brown had been touching the Eucharist during the communion, so during the transubstantiation. And then with the finger that touched um, the Eucharist, he put his finger right on her mouth and said, lead you evil spirit, and immediately the spirit left. So that again asserts the power of the body of Christ. Because, and this was a, a very popular theme, especially in French Catholic um, versions of exorcism, because in France particularly, there was loads of religious wars throughout the early modern period between Protestants and Catholics. And when the wars were going on, they also fought the war through depictions of exorcism, so you see a rise of exorcism when they aren't at war. And these exorcisms could be very famous. Some of them were mass possessions where like, numerous people, followers, were possessed. And then um, one of the main center um, themes in all of these texts was that they used the Eucharist to a massive degree um, in order to help exercise the evil spirits from the possessed person. And um, that's because the main, one of the main points of contention between Protestantism and Catholic, Catholicism it was um, tra transubstantiation, whether the body, whether the bread and wine actually became the body and blood of Christ. So that became a very key feature. Um, other, sisters, other objects, um, we have a case of Jesuits um, in the Jesuit annual lectures. Um, some poor little three year old boy, he was mute and he was possessed by demons. And so the Jesuit put a, a priest. Collar, just like a stone, on his neck, and that helped um, exercise the spirits from him. They also used holy water, they used holy relics. Um, one um, priest, Father Finity, came into um, contention for continuing to use um, the relics of the St. Malachi, and a lot of people didn't like that because it was after the Roman ritual, they shouldn't be using relics anymore. Because once the Roman ritual became published and circulated, it was you can use holy water, you can use communion, you shouldn't be using other things like that. Again, it's all about the reform. And um, so Brown performed his public exorcism, got arrested, he got um, imprisoned. And um, sources say um, studies on Brown that have focused on the political aspect of him. And I assert that he spent um, a year in prison without trial, and then a year afterwards, and um, he actually spent near four and a half to five years in prison. And it's just a mistranslation on his text, and um, that he is, and this mistranslation came from like, the 18th century onwards. And uh, so it's pretty confused by reading those sources. And. Um, Okay, so I think I'll move on to another. I think I'll move on to another case there. Um, and this case is completely different from any other cases that I have found in my work. And um, this is a public pamphlet from 1665 that I have no evidence of how far it went, but it was publicised with the intent to be spread at the very least. Um, there's one copy that I know of surviving. And this is fascinating because it is a personal account of someone's experience of being possessed in their vision of hell. And um, poor fellow was um, called Edmund Nangle. He's from County Longford, and um, and he suddenly became possessed. And um, he suddenly fell ill, had this massive vision of hell. And um, really interesting, you know, weird stuff happens in this. And um, that I can't go into too much because it's like a fifteen-page um, pamphlet, but. Um, in his vision of hell, he sees massive burn, furnaces around him, 
contributing to his bed. He sees like a massive wheel turning, and Satan is above him. There's like a massive eight foot blue light to the side underneath, and Satan's trying to chop his head off. And then he calls out for help, and then who appears? Only St. Patrick. <laughs> Not joking. Very unusual. Um, and St. Patrick tells him that if you repent, if you, if you, oh sorry, that's what I said, and then there was a Protestant. Um, so St. Patrick says, if you convert from Protestantism to Catholicism, I will save you. And Nangle is like, yeah, I will, okay. <laughs> so then, who does Patrick call? Only the Holy Mary herself. <laughs> the Holy Mary comes down with a load of golden scissors and she cuts the invisible ties that Satan has tied Edmund Nangle to the bed with. And he's relieved for a while, but not forever, but not for long, because this carries on for a number of days. At one stage, there's a Catholic priest and a Protestant minister fighting over him. He sees the minister as the devil, he's not sure if that's real, he sees everyone else as the devil, he's not sure if that's real. So over the course of a few days, the Catholic priest is saying, no, you need to follow me, and I know I'm the only one who can save you. And the Protestant minister is, no, he's wrong, I'm the only one who can save you. And then the man goes back and forth for a couple of days, and eventually he calls out for help again, and lo and behold, the Blessed Virgin Mary comes back down to him. <laughs> and she saves him, she brings a swarm of heavenly bees, down from heaven, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Down from heaven, the bees enter into his belly and his bowels, and they exercise all the vermin, all the filth, all the sludge from his belly and bowels. But happily, it's without any um, interference to his belly or bowels. I'm delighted to know. Um, and while that's quite a I suppose, trippy version of an exorcism. It's also kind of a wonderful metaphor because it's, it's not just the demons leaving him through the Holy Mary, but it's like um, the poisonous venom of Protestantism is leaving his body through the nurturing leaves of Catholicism. And this isn't me being like a, a person. <laughs> this is like a trope. Um, and so Edmund Mangle published Really, at least wrote the pamphlet, she published it, it's printed. Um, I'm still not sure how widely it was circulated. I don't even know if um, that would be something I'd be able to find out. Um, but a year later, he died after being involved in a Catholic rebellion in Longford. So that kind of goes to show you the real impact that this um, episode had on him. I mean, obviously, we're obviously terrified. Um, but you know, the real impact that this had on his life and on on people back then, it wasn't just, I was trying to laugh at the frost, but it was like, they believe it. And actually it's also um, a really unusual kind of difficulty as a historian that you have because then, um, when you're dealing with something like exorcism, and obviously you're most scientists, like, this is quite a secular world, you're dealing with something that, generally speaking, you're, you don't believe in, you don't, you think it's not real, but it's actually something that has always been part of the Catholic Church and it still is. And we are actually going through um, another rise in cases of possession in the last couple of decades. Um, and it's been the only rise since, um, since the early modern period. And there's this funny kind of elephant in the room aspect in the scholarship. Whereas in, in kind of the 70s, and 80s, when people started actually researching this um, and concentrating on it they kind of generally came to a, had to come to a conclusion of what was really happening. And generally it was like fraud or illness, and they were just, you know, making it up. And then this kind of slowly developed into people trying to analyze exactly what illness it could be. And um, now the general consensus is kind of, they'll take it for what it is, we can't go back in time and diagnose this because that's stepping in the bounds of history. Um, and I personally think that's kind of the best way to go as a historian because after that you're just kind of going, oh, well, I reckon it was that. And unless you have concrete proof to back it up, you're stepping out of the bounds of history because they weren't completely naive back then. There are cases where frauds were discovered and they knew about illnesses, they knew about epilepsy, they knew about, like, well, they called men and colleagues, stuff like that. So they knew that there were mental illnesses, so you, you can't just give that to everyone. 
Thanks, Simon. That was great. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah,
think we were so Yeah. Like, how could we choose to kind of, you know, study it in such in depth that <laughs> um, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, my undergrad years and my master's, I was really into depictions of spiritual authority in monastic texts in early Ireland. And I, I loved what I did, but I wanted to change it. And plus, um, it was suggested by my current supervisor. He was like, this hasn't been done before. I know that there are cases where people don't believe it. He was like, is this something you should do? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm interested in it. <laughs> because even though I don't believe in it, the cases are interesting from the start perspective because it's both um, religious hierarchy and lay people, and it's kind of the interconnection between the two. And sadly, they don't really talk about the lay involvement much. I mean, the girl that Brown possessed, she's a young girl, even name or And but it's also the, the process, like the going to archives, looking for documents, and compiling them, seeing what I want in them. So well, it's because it's the first, I'm the first kind of person to focus solely on this in Irish cases. So I have a lot of freedom in that I can pick and choose what I want to discuss, because in the conference you can't look for the case. Have you wavered at all when you've been studying it? Has it been like, um, maybe that was like, no, but to be honest with you, uh, generally the cases don't go into much detail. Okay. I have tried to read up on modern stuff and it's just pretty much terrible. What was his name? Ed Mountain Angle? Ed Mountain Angle. Ed Mountain Angle. That uh, pamphlet is available online on early English books online if you ever want to read it. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty yeah. trippy. So you said we're currently in a rise. Of exorcism. Oh, yeah, since like the 70s, 80s. Have we seen that rise in Ireland? Uh, no, we And I just, the main question I'm asking is, is because the way in which naturally 15, 16, 1700s, the way we dealt with things and our knowledge of medicine, science, um, would have been very different. While we would have had a huge knowledge back then, it's naturally, and I hope to God, has developed since yeah. the 1600s that a lot of the people that are suffering today from the same symptoms before are suffering from physiological conditions, tumours, yeah. schizophrenia, uh, personalities, or today that we better identified, and it wasn't that they weren't known back then, but the diagnostic techniques for identifying and diagnosing are better today. Yeah, and um, you get where you're coming from, you have to think, if you look back, you'd be like, why was there a rise when that happened? And it happens multiple times throughout um, Catholic history, the history of Catholic Church. And it's at times where there's a genuine belief when the world is coming and a massive crisis in the Catholic Church. I don't need to tell anyone that there's a massive crisis in the Catholic Church nowadays. But also, I mean, we're more connected globally than ever. I mean, if there's a crisis happening in the other side of the world, we know that straight away. Okay. So, there is a sense of, uh, I'm not apocalyptic here, but there is a sense of Jesus. Yeah. The world is fucking up. Yeah. <laughs> We can all agree probably, on that. It's probably the same as before. Yeah. Um, and do you think that at, at every at every moment when we kind of, I suppose I'm going to say the Catholic Church can lots of research, that when the Catholic Church is kind of saying, yeah. oh, well, lads, this is it, you know, we're, we're in a bad place now. Is there, it seems to be a correlation between that and the rise of exorcisms, nearly a, a scaremongering historically? That's hard to say because it always comes from the ground up. Okay. It's the rise of exorcisms happened because there's a rise in Session. Yeah. And it's never the other way. And who publicizes these then? The the rise in, in possession, for example. Like how, how do I know that someone has been possessed? How do I know that these figures are, are factual that someone hasn't randomly and I'm not questioning it because the science I think we can all agree well but trains the on facts are also trains to prove the unknown. It comes but, from um, the same, like, yeah. if you actually Google it like this exorcist in Italy, like Jesus Christ, I can't get exorcist actually yeah. they're too afraid and he's yeah. like I'm dealing with them more than ever. Yeah. More than ever. And wow. so it's I'm not aware of any database or anything. Well no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it, it's coming from them being like we can't cope with the work that we have. Okay. We have to do a phone you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, cool. it's not um, it's just coming from them. It's yeah. coming from Uh, one last question. Just in terms of um, the research, do you find it hard to find the sources? Just because, as you said, it's very hard that someone hasn't been studied it in depth. In terms of secondary sources, and even primary sources, is it hard? Or... Um, secondary sources, there's a huge number. 
are some. Some people have looked at the cases in a certain way, and it's gone from there, and that's another book. Um, crime resources. Um, when I went into this, I knew of um, Caption History. And I, I've just been, I've been really lucky. Like, I just, I hope that something happens. Like, oh, there's a history of this murder. I hope I find something. And I do. And I know I hope not all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, it happened way more. Like, I went from kind of coming into second year being like, oh god, I have nothing still. And then towards the end of the summer being like, oh well, that's my PhD sort of there. And I'm still finding <laughs> stuff. And now I'm like, oh god, is this going to be a full stop there at the end of it? <laughs> How are, people, how are people reciprocating to your research? How are they responding in general? In general, people are like, oh yeah, that's interesting. It's, yeah, it's an interesting topic. It's, you know, <laughs> that's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> cool, thanks. All right, thank you very much.